Good morning. Uh, if you have your Bible, go ahead and open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. That's page 1,219. <laughs> well, that's where I'm preaching from, so... <laughs> You must have bigger letters than I do. No, smaller letters. All right, now we have been speaking for some time on knowing our role. What's my role and what's your role? And today we're getting into the last uh, section of Scripture that specifically deals with gifts. Gifts being those things that God through His Spirit, gives us to enable us to do His will. Uh, we've looked at Ephesians chapter 4. We've looked at 1 Peter. Uh, we've looked at uh, Romans chapter 12 last week. Um, today we're going to be speaking about 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And, and actually in the next week or so, we're, we're going to try and wrap these things together. Um, hopefully you've all taken the spiritual gift test. Um, one of the things that I, I, I need to reiterate from the start is that none of these lists are exhaustive. None of these lists are intended to be everything. Okay? These are samples of, of the giftings that God gives for people to work at His church. Okay? Um, now, uh, in Ephesians chapter 4, we talked about equipping ministry gifts. These, these are the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher. And their job, if you read further down in Ephesians 4, is to prepare the church to be able to accomplish what God has given them to do. Um, we, uh, I have been thoroughly enjoying um, Chuck Missler's uh, teaching on Ephesians. Um, wow, there are some people that are just really smart. Um, they have brains that, that operate on an entirely different level than most of us. Um, so men, that's an encouragement to you to come to the brothers meeting. Um, one of the things that, that uh, we were listening to this last Thursday um, is basically something that I've said a couple times before. Uh, my job, my task, the, the thing that God has given me is to help prepare you so that you can do the things that God has given you. Okay? Um, in so many church settings, uh, we, we've completely reorganized how the body works and, and we put a lot of things in places that they don't belong. Um, I believe that a pastor, uh, their primary responsibility is the welfare of the flock and a teacher's primary responsibility is to teach the things of the Word of God so that the flock will be not taken off guard by those of shrewd speech. Okay? Um, however, there are other things that typically a pastor is given to do that I am, I'm not gifted in. Okay? I just, I, I've, I've got certain areas that God has gifted me, and uh, see, God, God <laughs> equips the called. Thank God. Okay? Because if... if God were calling me based on something that I had to stand in front of you and talk, I wouldn't be here. I'd be back there. Okay? Um, I think God does this so that we cannot brag about our abilities. Okay? Because I have no natural ability to be a public speaker. I don't like being in front. Okay? Um, 
Denise and I were, were editing the videos this week, and I realized when I was listening to the video, I say okay a lot. <laughs> that's one of those things that's really going to bother me, because I'm going to start counting them every time I do it. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so if I just like stop and get a weird look on my face, it's probably because I was going to say okay. <laughs> okay, there we go. <laughs> We looked at the body ministry gifts, those gifts that are given, they are offices, they are positions that a person is called to, to enable the body to function the way that it needs to, to function, okay? Um, last week, we talked about the body ministry gifts. Uh, this was in Romans, <clears throat> excuse me, chapter 12, and these gifts include things that help the body. Now, this is a little bit different from the equipping ministry gifts in that Equipping ministry gifts are usually given to people that are in some way or another uh, in, in some leadership position, okay? The, the body ministry gifts, those are gifts that the body is given to minister to the body, okay? That's stuff that is supposed to work all this, okay? It's okay. <laughs> uh, wow. So these gifts include service, <coughs> teaching, exhortation or encouragement, giving, leadership or administration, and mercy. Now, mercy is a little bit of an interesting one because we're all called to mercy. And if you don't have the gift of mercy, you still need to practice mercy. Okay? Um, Remember that we are being transformed to be like him. And mercy is a part of his character. It's a part of his nature. So if, if you struggle with mercy, that's okay. So long as you're struggling, don't just give up. So today, we are going to be talking about the manifestation gifts. And I, I'm only using these terms to just kind of separate out. Now, one of the things in body ministry gifts that I did not touch on... Um, is prophecy. In, in Romans chapter 12, one of the gifts that he lists is prophecy. I didn't touch on that because I think this actually works in two different areas. Uh, and, and it's interesting because this is the only gift that is in all three passages. So, ministry, or manifestation gifts, I think, are predominantly not always, but predominantly gifts that occur in the moment. They are given for a specific time and a specific purpose. And you might move at different times in different of these gifts as God sees fit to give you. There are some that are gifted with a particular manifestation gift repeatedly, okay? But that gift is not an office except for prophet. And we're going we're gonna, to, hopefully I can explain to you a little bit of the difference in the nature of the office of prophet and the gift of prophecy. Because they're really two different things. So let's uh, go ahead and pick up. I'm not going to go all the way back to, to 12... Uh, yeah, we'll start at 12.1. Hopefully you guys have read this passage. Hopefully you've backed up a little bit. Uh, does anybody know, without looking at your Bible, does anybody know what, what Paul was addressing right before this? Spirit. The Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper, 1 Corinthians 11. He's talking about the function of the body, and the Spirit is part of it because that's what gives us the gifts and ties all of this together. But, but he's talking about the Lord's Supper, communion, and, and how we should and shouldn't celebrate it. Now keep in mind when Paul was right, well actually he probably didn't write this, when Paul was dictating this, the transcriber did not get to the end of this communion sentence, this communion passage, and put chapter 12, verse 1. We put that in, the church put that in, so we could all find the same place together at the same time. Because we don't memorize scripture the way they used to memorize scripture. Okay? 
and, and that's to our, to our shame. By the way, I do have a new verse for you. I just don't have it up on the overhead. So remind me at the, again, the end, I will give you a new memory verse. Okay? So, chapter 12, verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers. By the way, brothers, that's, that's men and women of Delphi. So that's all of us. Okay? Um, I do not want you to be uninformed. So he's giving us information that we need. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says, Jesus is accursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except in the Holy Spirit. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Now, I'm going to stop here because Paul lays out a couple things that we have to understand before we start looking at the gifts. First, um, where do the gifts come from? The Spirit. Who are the gifts for? The body. The body, the common good. Okay? So one of the things that we really, before we ever even get into what the gifts are, we've got to lock into our brain, is that it's not about us. Okay? It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about us. The group. Okay? The focus should always be God reaching down into his community of believers, into the body of Christ, into the ecclesia, and making his presence known, making his will known, okay, to whatever purpose. So when, when you ever get into a place where somebody is, is all that about their gift, be careful, okay? Be careful, because when the focus is shifted at any point away from God, it's never a good thing. It's always a bad thing. Okay? So, first thing we need to understand, it's not ours. It's given to us and through us by the Spirit. And that it's for the common good. Verse 8. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge, according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. All right, now, we want an interpretation for that. <laughs> now, some of you, your, your passages may have read a little bit differently. Um, starting at the, the top of the list and going through, going through to the bottom, um, we have utterances of wisdom, or some of you might have words of wisdom. Does anybody have something different be besides utterances or words of wisdom? I'm sorry? It says message in mind. Message, message okay. Wisdom. Yep, message of wisdom, okay. Um, again, going down to the next one, an utterance or a message or a word of knowledge. Um, faith. Now, this this. Faith is not saving faith. We'll, we'll touch on this a little bit more. This is a different kind of faith. It's, it's more of a, uh, uh, a blooming of faith. Um, not everybody will have this kind of faith. Healing. Does anybody have something other than healing? Good, because you shouldn't. Um, working of miracles. Prophecy. 
The, to distinguish or discernment of spirits. Does somebody have something different besides distinguish or discernment? No, okay. Um, different kinds of tongues and interpretation of tongues. Yeah. All right, let's touch on these for just a little bit. Um, I'm going to try and give you examples. Now, I'm going to give you the Greek, what it literally means. And then I'm going to give you my understanding of what I think that gift is. Okay? So if you've heard somebody teach, oh no, that gift is this way, that's okay. Because when God moves on you to use the gift, it's not dependent on your knowledge. Okay? It's dependent on His grace. Okay? So um, utterance or a word of wisdom. Uh, now, the, word, the Greek word used here is logos, which many of you may remember uh, there was actually a big move years ago, Logos and Rhema. Um, Logos being the written word of God, Rhema being the word made alive. Uh, technically in the Greek, that, that is not really how that works, but it, it's a good assignment of words to, to, to explain the difference. Um, either one of these can be written or spoken. Uh, rhema uh, can be written or spoken. Logos can be written or spoken. Uh, so that there, there really is not a lot of differentiation between the usage of those. But um, God does make his word alive, right? Because his word is living. Okay, so there are times when you will read a passage or, or I will read a passage that I've read numerous times before and then all of a sudden, all of a sudden something just clicks in my brain and I, I have a different understanding. Okay? Because there are times when I'm reading scripture, and I know you guys don't do this, but there are times when I read scripture and my brain just goes, beep, and I get to the end and realize I, I, don't, I don't remember anything of what I just read. And so I go back and I start over and I might get three or four words into it and you know, my brain flatlines and, and, or wanders off. Um, but there are times when God brings his word to life right before our eyes, right in our spirit. Now, an utterance or a word, Logos literally translated means word, and it can be uh, either speaking or written. Um, and then the, the wisdom is Sophia, and that means prudence, or the ability to know and deal with people, wisdom. Okay? Now, I want to uh, contrast wisdom and knowledge, because... Paul listed both of them. One is not the other. Okay? Uh, for an example of wisdom, uh, I believe that we see the gift of wisdom being used through James in Acts 15 at the Council of Jerusalem. Okay? We don't understand the significance of that council because we have been born generations after that decision was reached. But that is one of the most pivotal points in the history of the world. Okay? Because at that time, they had to decide who salvation was to. Actually, they didn't decide. They had to acknowledge who salvation was to. Because up to this point, salvation was to the Jews. And remember, when Jesus, last thing he told them is, go out and be my witnesses. Up to this point, they were stuck in Jerusalem. They weren't going out. We, we see that uh, God spoke to Peter and had him go and preach the gospel to Cornelius and all of Cornelius' household. Cornelius being a Roman, being a Gentile, being not a Jew, uh, the same manifestation of the Spirit was poured out on him and his household as was poured out in the upper room. And that was something that, that Peter was not really prepared for. And then we see Paul and Barnabas being sent out from the church at Antioch. They're there to go out and take the message. Well, where do they go first? They go to the synagogues. They go to the Jewish <coughs> churches, the, the Jewish assemblies in each of these cities, and they preach the gospel to the Jews. And at first the Jews are like, wow, cool, all right. But then... When they have them come back to speak the next time, Gentiles come. Now keep in mind, this is something that we, we, we really have to get about the Jews. They had been God's chosen people 
for a thousand years. They were blessed by God. They are still blessed by God as his people. Okay? Even though they're not serving him. Isn't that amazing? You, you know the passage. We misuse this passage all the time. The gifts and the calling are without repentance. That's actually speaking about the Jews. God is not going to turn back on everything that he said he was going to do for them. He's not going to shut them out forever. He's working on us for a time, but he will go back to working with them. So they go to the Jews. The Jews see all these, these Gentiles come in and, and Paul and Barnabas get kicked out of the, the synagogue. And then after a time, Paul, who already knew that he was called to be an apostle to the Gentiles, which is amazing when you think about it, because of all of the apostles that we know, Paul was the most learned. He understood the intricacies of Judaism better than any of the disciples, the apostles that Jesus called to himself. How much do you suppose Peter knew? Or Matthew? Or Simon? The zealot, not Simon Peter. Okay? Paul grew up into it. Whereas most of the apostles would have had an elementary level understanding, Paul was taught, he had a college level understanding because he took on all of the teaching that could be provided to him. He was a disciple of Gamaliel who even today is held up in, in good repute with Jews today. Okay? So the, the ministry uh, started with the Jews and then poured out as God had promised to all people. So, when, when they are coming together to decide the, the Gentile question, I believe James is moved on by the Spirit of God to open the doors and welcome in the Gentiles. And he even goes so far as to say it is not good that we should place such burdens on them. Okay? Because salvation is by faith. It's not by works. Works will come out of it, but, but it's, it's not going to be by works. And this, this is an amazing, absolutely mind-blowing thing that a group of Jewish men who had been raised their entire life to believe that salvation was to the Jews and the Gentiles were no better than dogs, now they are inviting them in to the same inheritance that they themselves received. Okay? Now, there is a difference between a Messianic Jew and a, a Gentile Christian in the way that God deals with us, but that's, that's God's business. Salvation comes to both of us only one way, and that's through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Okay? Uh, the, the biggest difference is that the Jews received the law and the prophets teaching them how important and significant Jesus is, how, how desperate their need for Jesus is. Okay, so coming back into this, I believe that James, when he lays out uh, this, this statement of, of accepting the Gentiles into um, Christianity, because at this point they weren't even called Christians, they were called the Nazarene sect, um, and I think that was a, a word of wisdom. God spoke to him something to address a particular problem at a particular time. God, how do we do this? God answered, and boom, there they had the answer. Okay? Now, utterance or word of knowledge. Uh, again, logos, it's the power of speech or, or the word. And then the, the knowledge part is gnosis. Um, and that means <laughs> knowledge. Okay? It means to know. Okay? So, a word of knowledge. How do we separate uh, a word of wisdom from a word of knowledge? Um, a word of knowledge is that you would be given a word that you had no way in your natural mind of knowing, and yet it applies to a particular event or a particular time. Um, I Honestly, I believe that God has used me with a word of knowledge at, at least once. Um, I had a, an occasion, I was speaking to a pastor, and um, 
What I was going to say is not what came out of my mouth. And as I was listening to what came out of my mouth, I knew something that there should have been no way I could know. But the pastor needed that. And, and he needed to deal with that in that moment. That's not to float my boat. I'm ignorant. Okay? I was ignorant. I didn't know what was going on. But God used me because the pastor had been prevaricating. He'd been, he'd been delaying doing something that needed to be done. Usually, I'm the one receiving the boot in the bottom of the pants. That time, God let me be the boot to the bottom of his pants to get his mind. Okay, i got to deal with this. All right? Um, so, word of wisdom uh, is having wisdom beyond what you should in and of yourself. A wisdom that God gives you. Uh, a word of knowledge is to know something that you wouldn't otherwise know. Faith. Now, faith, pistis. Okay, this is the, the same word is used all throughout the Bible uh, for faith. Um, in the New Testament, it specifically is speaking of the Christian, the, the, the matter of Christian character being combined with belief. So, I'm gonna, we have to differentiate a couple of things. First, there is an office of prophet. What does that look like? Well, go read the prophets. Okay? We, we tend to confuse the issue because um, we're not all prophets, are we? No. You see, you guys need to keep up. You need to tell me these things. Um, faith, peace, peace. Um, this is not saving faith. We know that there are different measures of faith given at different times to different people. We know that the demons have faith. The demons believe and shudder. Okay? I wish we had as much faith as the demons had. Maybe we could do it some shuddering. This is different than that faith that saves. Okay? This is a measure of faith beyond the norm, again, for a particular time. Um, God may speak something to you that has not yet happened, usually so that you can pray for it to happen. But sometimes also so that you can be uh, instrumental in making it happen. And when he gives it to you, you think there is no way. Okay. There is no way. But because of the faith that the Spirit gives you, your natural mind may be reeling, thinking there's no possible way that this can happen. But because of the faith that the Spirit gives you, you know it will. Okay. Um, there are some people that are gifted with this uh, regularly. Okay. Uh, but I don't believe that that, uh, that disqualifies any of us from having a gift of faith in a particular event because it's not based on our uh, ability, our credibility, our worth. It, it's based on the Spirit of God doing what God chooses to do. Okay? So, faith, not saving faith but an extra measure of faith to pray for or to be involved in bringing something about that God has revealed to you. An example for this, uh, if you look in uh, Acts, I think it's 27. Yeah, Paul is on the ship bound for Rome. The ship uh, goes against sound advice and puts out in winter. They come into a big storm. They get blown off course. Uh, the men are despairing even of their lives. They, they've actually determined that they're going to kill the prisoners on ship rather than letting them escape. Paul receives a word from God that says the ship will be lost, but not one life will be lost. Okay? When they're, they're saying, hey, look, yeah, we're, gonna, we're throwing stuff overboard. We're going to kill you guys so that you can't escape. 
That's the best way to make sure nobody escapes, I guess. Um, but Paul says, hey, no, look, my God has told me the ship will be lost, but not one life will be lost. Everyone will be spared. He acted out on what God told him. Okay? And his faith carried the crew and the other passengers. That's an extra measure of faith that was needed for that time. you got to wonder how convincing he was, or maybe he wasn't. Just the Spirit of God going out from him, calming their fears. Okay? Um, so faith, a measure of faith beyond that required unto salvation, because God has revealed something to you that he wants you to pray until it comes into existence, or pray and work until it comes into existence. Healing! Koilea. This is uh, the, it is a, uh, well, let's, let's actually do the whole thing. Um, it's gifts of healing. Uh, that's koilea um, alamatos. I'm sorry, let me try that again. Iamatos. Uh, it is a plural thing, not a, a singular. It's gifts of healings. Okay. I don't know why they translated that in the singular, probably because everything else was singular, but it is literally speaking of plural. And this is, uh, in effect, it serves one of two purposes. One, it is to minister to the body of Christ. Okay? We see this uh, in James chapter 5. When James says, hey, if any of you is sick, let him call the elders and they will come and they will put their hands on him and they will pray for him and he will be healed. Okay, that's, that's to minister within the body of Christ. But it is also to be a witness and a testimony to unbelievers about Christ. Okay, we see this example um, when Paul was on the island on the first missionary journey and the uh, Paulos had... Uh, a servant that was sick, and Paul came and prayed for him, and uh, he was healed, and then Paulos believed because of the miraculous power of the healing. Okay? Now, we also see that healing is one of the things that Jesus says in uh, Matthew chapter 16 will be a sign for the believers. Okay? They will lay their hands on the sick, and they will be healed. Okay? Now, one of the things that we have to caution uh, people about, whereas I believe that there are some that move more easily in gifts of healing, um, I do not believe, and I don't think you can find in Scripture, that every person is going to be healed of everything. Okay? Because God uses things for His purposes. God uses them. So there is not... And not everybody is going to be healed um, every time. We, we see examples of this. Uh, Paul speaking to Timothy. He doesn't tell him to, to have hands laid on him and, and to that way be getting rid of the, the frequent, frequent ailments in his stomach. What does he tell him? Drink some wine. Actually, he says, take a little wine. Okay? So, I mean, I know you can drink yourself into oblivion and not feel anything, but that, that is not what Paul is addressing there. Okay? So, let's just clarify that. Um, so, healing. To minister to the body of Christ, to be a testimony and a witness to those outside the body of Christ. Um, working of miracles. Energema. What does that sound like? Energy, that's exactly what it means. Energy. Um, energy, and then the second word is dunamis, which is, we, get, we actually get the word dynamo from this. That means power. Okay? So literally what he's saying is energy and power. Okay? To do things that we're not normally able to do. That, that, that comes outside of the natural and enters into the supernatural. Now that can be a lot of different things. If any of you have read uh, The Heavenly Man, I, I would encourage you, if you haven't, to go ahead and read it. But he talks about some of the miracles that God did in his life. Uh, things like walking out of one of the most notorious prisons in China completely unhindered. People didn't even see him. He just got up and walked out. Okay? 
Um, while he was in prison, uh, his, his wife and his family was in a village. They were being ostracized by the village because they were Christians. Um, they, they managed to plant uh, their rice. A storm came up. The storm destroyed every rice field that the village had except for theirs. Okay. Now, if that had just ended there, that's an incredible thing, isn't it? Because it's not like theirs was off to the side. It was just right there where the rice paddies go. But that wasn't the only thing. God so abundantly blessed their field that they were able to share with the rest of the village. And by that testimony, people started coming and asking them about this new thing that they believed. Okay? What was the end result of the miracle? Was it to glorify the family? No. no. It was to be a means whereby the family might be able to minister more effectively to the unbelievers. Okay? So there are, to say, um, you know, working of miracles, we really, we can't really encapsulate what all that means. Okay? You look at some of the things that are going on in the Middle East today. Entire villages are being saved because uh, visions of a man in white calling them to himself. We see miracles that are going all over the world. I believe we don't see them as much here in America because we don't need them. We've got doctors and pharmacies and insurance. We've got programs that help us out. We, we very often look to the natural. But boy, when, when something happens that, that the natural can't deal with, boy, then we start praying for a miracle, don't we? Okay? So uh, I believe absolutely that we will not see as many incredible miracles here in the United States until we're broken free of, of those things that we use to replace our dependence on God. Okay? Now, that's not to say there aren't miracles happening in the United States. They are. They're just not as, as uh, for lack of a better word, I'll say big as what we see in other places. Okay? So, prophecy. I knew we'd get there eventually. Okay, prophetias. To prophesy either in the prophetic office or the prophetic manifestation. Now, there's a couple of things that we need to be understanding with prophecy. First, there is an office of prophet and there is a gift of prophecy. The prophet may or may not have a particular gift of prophecy. And a person that has the gift of prophecy may not be a prophet. The prophet is an office called. And what do prophets do? Now, don't answer that. Most people, because I know you guys are, are biblically literate, I know you don't believe this, but most people believe that a prophet is somebody that foretells future events. No. That's prophecy. That's different. The number one task, the number one commission, the number one job of a prophet is to speak to the people the things of God so that the people will be encouraged or exhorted to move back into the things of God. Yep. Read the prophets in the Old Testament. The major and the minor prophets. The vast majority of what they had to say did not have to do with events coming down the road. They had to do with warnings and chastisements and encouragements. Come back to God. Hey, you're being drawn away. This is dangerous stuff you're playing with. Be on your guard. When, when God calls Ezekiel, what does he call Ezekiel to be? A watchman. And he actually gives him a very strict uh, <clears throat> definition of what he was supposed to do. He said if uh, the watchman is up in the tower and he sees the enemy coming and he gives warning but the people do not respond, their blood is on their own head. I will not hold you accountable for them. But if the watchman is in the tower or on the wall and he sees the enemy coming, coming and he gives no warning, their blood will be on his head. Okay? 
the vast majority of what prophets do is to make people aware of, of where they are in relation to God. Okay? Now the gift of prophecy, and like I said, some prophets had this gift, this particular aspect of the gift, is to speak for things that, that might be coming down the road. Now let's, let's just qualify this. Someone that is gifted with prophecy is not necessarily going to be gifted to foretell events. They might be gifted instead of foretelling to foretell. To speak forth the things of God. To speak out of the word of God. And to deal with what is going on wherever they are. Okay? Because when God calls a prophet to give a warning, it's because you weren't paying attention when he tried to talk to you. Or me. Okay? A, a prophet is like the flick in the head to get your attention. Okay? God whispers. God speaks. I'm telling you, don't go there. It's, it's not good. Don't go there. And we wrestle with that inside voice. Now, the, the, the unfortunate part of the inside voice, which I think speaks to uh, the majesty of God, is that we can tune it out. Mm -hmm. We can ignore it. We can cover it up. But I tell you what, when God speaks a word of prophecy, whether through the office of prophet or through the gift of prophecy, pay attention. Because ultimately it is for your good. Okay? So, the office of prophet being a distinct position separate from the gift of prophecy, the gift of prophecy as we see here uh, may use foretelling or even forthtelling. I think the most of the time that this gift is used, it is forthtelling. Used as a warning, as a correction, as a, a safeguard to keep us from things that would otherwise hurt us. Okay? Um, all right. Uh, distinguishing between spirits or discernment of spirits. Diacrisis, to distinguish uh, and, or uh, to distinguish or decide or judge. And pneuma. You guys, you guys know what pneuma means? Okay, we, had, we derive the word pneumatic from this. Does anybody know what a, a pneumatic press is? Or <coughs> how does that work? Air. 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 Pneuma means air. That's, that's the root of it, okay? But depending on how the word is used, it can be air, it can be breath, or it can be spirit. Okay? And in this case, we believe that, very rightly so, that this is a, a judging of spirits. Okay? Now, how does this work? I think sometimes you just know when somebody is doing something and professing to do it in Christ, and it's not. There's just a knowing that you can't claim credit for. You ever get the feeling, hmm, something's just not right about that person? You know? I think, honestly, uh, I think a lot of us harden ourselves through the act of growing up to um, not be able to do this as well. Because I'll tell you what, if a dog doesn't like someone, be on your guard. Yeah. Yeah. If a child doesn't like someone, be on your guard. Okay? They're more sensitive to it. Okay? So, so pay attention. Because it might be, just be that you have a jerk for a dog. <laughs> <laughs> or it might just be that your child is having a bad day. Okay? Um, <laughs> Yeah, I'm talking about you. Um, so, a discernment of spirits. And so, literally, to distinguish between the spirits. Now, why is this gift necessary? I think it goes right along uh, side prophecy. It's to keep us aware. It's to keep us safe. It's to keep us protected. Okay? Um, I think a lot of people move in this without realizing that they're doing so. All right? And uh, the last two are actually kind of knitted together. The different kinds of tongues. Uh, does anybody have a different language there? Kinds of, or different uh, words there? Kinds of tongues? Okay, we'll, we'll just assume everybody's on the same page. Um, kinds of tongues. Uh, genos, to become. And glossa, tongue. 
specifically speaking. Okay? Um, now, in this passage, if you continue reading through 13 and into 14, you go back to Acts and you see uh, the manifestation of the Spirit uh, in the upper room at Pentecost, you see that they were speaking in a language that they themselves did not know, but the people that they were speaking to knew. Okay? Now, um, I've heard a lot of different people's insight and opinion into this. Thaddeus, would you bring my water up for me, please? Uh, I believe that, that uh, tongues used properly are effective in the body of Christ, but they are intended for those outside the body of Christ. Thank you. Uh, for example, who is in the upper room? The disciples. Yeah, those that believed. Okay? And then when they spoke in tongues, and actually we don't believe they were in the upper room when they spoke in tongues, the, the way that it, it reads, I believe they were on the southern steps to the temple. Okay? Because when Peter sees these things happening, and he sees all these converts coming, he says, go and be baptized. Well, on the southern steps to the temple are all the mikvahs. That's all the baths. Okay? Because they had to cleanse themselves before going up into the temple. Uh, the, the southern steps was a known gathering place for people to, to discourse. And so I believe that, that uh, the, they were on the southern steps. And, and when God gave them utterance, the Jews from all these other nations had an understanding. Now, I don't know how, how God works it because God's a whole lot smarter than I am. I don't know if God gifted the mouth of the speaker or opened the ears to the listener or did something altogether different. I don't know. I know two things happened. Somebody spoke and somebody understood. Okay? And the understanding led them to salvation. Okay? Now, I believe there is a second use of tongues, and this use is private. Okay? I believe when Paul addresses this issue in, um, later on in chapter 12 and into 14, um, I think Paul is, is saying that there is an intimacy where you will speak in tongues, where, where you will converse with God in a language you don't know. I believe that use of the tongue is never to be used in church. Okay? Nobody should hear that besides God. That's what Paul addresses in 14. But in the church, I believe that there is a use for the gift of tongues as long as there is also the gift of interpretation. Okay? Um, I grew up in a Pentecostal church. I went to a Pentecostal Holiness Bible College. I got in a lot of trouble because I don't agree with uh, the things that they teach and espouse there. Okay? Um, and I'll tell you why. We'll jump down here in just a minute. But uh, in the gift of tongues, speaking out in a language that you do not know, and then there is an interpretation by somebody, uh, and again, I don't know how this works, I don't know if this per person spoke in a language that I can't understand, but that God gave that person the ability to understand, or I, I don't know. But if this person isn't present, this person should remain silent. Okay? Okay? So, uh, kinds of tongues and the interpretation of tongues, uh, they, they're hand in glove. They have to go together. Now, I'm going to wrap up with this. Next week we're actually going to carry on a little bit more because I want to share with you guys a little bit deeper about what Paul is talking because 1 Corinthians is, is where Paul addresses in the greatest depth the, the, the spiritual gifts. Okay, So if you jump all the way down um, We see that Paul reiterates a number of gifts, and these are all gifts that we have talked about previously. So in, in verse 27, now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. So um, Chuck Missler says, we, we move in unity, not in uniformity. 
okay? We, we move together because we have the same common denominator inside of us, not because we all look and act the same, because we're all called to different positions in the body of Christ, but we should all be sealed by the Spirit and Christ dwelling in us, okay? So, 28, and God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administration, uh, various kinds of tongues. Now, look, pay attention to verse 29, uh, 30, and 31. Are all apostles, these are rhetorical questions. The obvious answer is no, because he's just talked about each of us being gifted as the Spirit decides. Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? Now, this last verse is key. It says, but earnestly desire the higher gifts. What those higher gifts are, we'll, we'll discuss hopefully next week, God willing. So earnestly desire those and I will show you a still more excellent way. Okay, so Paul has just gone through a list, uh, a not comprehensive list, but a list of spiritual gifts. And then he gets to the end of this and he says, but now I'm going to show you something better. Okay? We are to desire spiritual gifts, but we are to pursue, we are to take hold of spiritual fruit. Okay? So, next week, we'll get into uh, chapter 13 and 14, and we'll, we'll start wrapping all of this together. Um, yeah. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, for your spirit that can give us insight and understanding into your word. We ask, Father, that you would take the word today, that you would plant it deep in our heart, that, Father, we would hold it in our minds and, and ponder it and, and deal with it, Father, that, that we would let you bring us an understanding. And we thank you. In Jesus' name.